everyone. Let us discuss today regarding the interpretation of a sleep study report. By the end of this talk, we should have an idea regarding understanding the technical information which is provided in a polysomnographic report and how do we correlate the different parameters which are served in the sleep study report with the clinical presentation of the patient and how this kind of a diagnosis is helpful in managing the patient. So, a sleep study records several physiological parameters for diagnosis of sleep-related disorders. Parameters related to sleep, parameters related to respiratory events, to cardiac events, leg movements, and a lot of other parameters are presented to the clinician in the sleep study report. Any deviation of specific parameters from the normal indicates towards some kind of sleep-related disorder. Every parameter, be it the apnea, hypoapnea index, be it the sleep efficiency or the periodic leg movement index, every such parameter conveys vital information. Understanding these parameters correctly is important in clinical diagnosis. So a sleep study report is prepared section-wise. The first section is about the patient's basic information, where we get to learn about the patient's age, height, weight, BMI, the medications previously he or she is taking, and any comorbidities or any other disorders the patient is suffering from. Because uh, the BMI has definite correlation with some respiratory or sleep disorders. The medications the patient might be taking can definitely influence sleep. And other comorbidities that the patient has also are related to disorders of sleep. Then we have information on the sleep parameters like the sleep efficiency, the time in different stages of sleep, etc. The respiratory parameters which we will be discussing in the coming few slides, the leg movement and the cardiac parameters. So this is how a sleep study is done. Grossly, this is some, uh, this is how the patient is hooked up to so many channels which are connecting information from the EEGs to the respiratory airflow, snoring, ECGs, efforts, leg movement, oximeter, so a lot of channels, a lot of electrodes, monitoring sensors are attached to the patient and this information throughout the course of the night is recorded carefully by the technician and the technician is very vigilant regarding the presence of any artifacts, any disturbances, which he should properly correct. And also, he monitors the patient throughout the night so that at the end of it, a good quality sleep study can be prepared. So now let us begin with the nomenclature used in sleep study report. The first one is the lights off or the lights out. The beginning of the study or the time at which the patient first attempts to fall asleep the lights, television and other devices are turned off. This is the lights off time. Impedance checks, amplifier calibrations and physiological calibrations are completed before the lights out time and also the artifacts are corrected. Lights on time. The end of the study or the point at which the technician enters the room to wake up the patient is the lights on time. It is desirable, recommended that post-test calibrations, be it the device calibration or the physiological calibration, they are to be performed after lights on. So what is the total recorded time? The total time during which sleep study was being recorded. Total sleep time is the total time asleep after lights out. Sleep onset is the start of the first epoch scored at any other stage other than stage weight. Usually in more than 95% of people, you will have it as N1. So the time from the uh, uh, time the sleep study was started, Till the onset of N1 is the sleep onset time. Sleep latency is the time from lights off until the patient enters into sleep. So usually it is 10 to 20 minutes for normal people. A shorter sleep latency could indicate sleep deprivation or any sleep disorder. And a long sleep latency is common in conditions like sleep onset insomnia. Vaso is the wake after sleep onset, which is the total amount of time spent awake after initially falling asleep. It could be because of uh, fragmentation of sleep, like seen in insomnia, like seen in sleep-related breathing disorders, or like it is seen in case of periodically movement disorder. 
So whenever there is any disruption or to sleep, that means to wake up or wake after sleep onset, it gets counted in the vaso. So when a patient is awake during sleep, it affects the quality of sleep and is also often associated with some kind of sleep disorder. So when we talk about time in bed, there are two relevant sections. One is the sleep period time, which is the time between first falling asleep and the last waking up. So this is the sleep period time. It includes total sleep time and the vaso. Total sleep time is the sleep period time that is first sleep to the last wake minus the wake after sleep onset. So this is actually the sleep, actual sleep time is the total sleep time when the patient was actually sleeping and sleep period time is total sleep time plus also the wake which happened in between sleep. Sleep efficiency is another very important terminology. It is the percentage of total sleep time by the total time spent in bed. Mostly, usually it's more than 85%. Patient with insomnia, with sleep related breathing disorders, with periodic limb movement disorders, with parasomnias, uh, with any kind of sleep related disorder, they usually have a decreased sleep latency, sleep efficiency. And as the disorders are taken care of, managed, and uh, maybe the insomnia is managed well, so efficiency gradually keeps on improving into the normal ranges. So REM latency is another important nomenclature. This is a time lag from the points lights are switched off until the sleep study reveals the first epoch with REM phase. So usually it is somewhere between uh, one and a half to two hours, that is 90 to 120 minutes. Certain diseases like narcolepsy present with sleep onset REM. So there are four sleep stages as we know, three in non-REM and one in REM. So non-REM stage has stage 1, non-REM is 10 to 12% of total sleep, stage 2 is approximately 45 to 55%, which is the maximum duration of any stage in sleep. Slow wave sleep or stage 3 is 15 to 20% and REM is 20 to 25%. So this is how it is. These are the different waves which are present in different sleep stages. Alpha is usually stage wave. Uh, theta waves are present in stage N1 and theta waves continue here also along with some spindles and K complexes which define it as stage N2. Waves become slower, they become slow wave, the delta waves in stage N3 and again theta waves are present in stage REM along with rapid eye movements. So this is how the sleep staging with the waveforms are. Okay, so usually there are, you know, there, there are four to five cycles of sleep in the course of the night which has non-REM REM cycle every 90 minutes and thus the sleep qualitatively changes during the course of the night. Let's have a look at this hypnogram. This is a hypnogram which shows consolidated sleep in a good sleeper. So there are stages N1, REM, N2, N3 and all these stages are present one after the other four to five times during the course of the night. Okay, and no fragmentation is seen. So this is a consolidated sleep. Compare it with this hypnogram, which is of a, which is of some a person with fragmented sleep or disturbed sleep. Here, there are lots of wake after sleep onset. The patient doesn't reach deep sleep at all. So here we will say that sleep is fragmented, sleep stage shift is quick, and uh, the sleep is not consolidated. What data are you inferring from the sleep stage record? So is the duration and distribution of sleep stage age appropriate? Is the sleep consolidated or is it interrupted with frequent stage shifts? Like frequent wakes occurring in between. Was the distribution of specific waveforms like spindles, delta, alpha, normal in frequency and distribution? Right? And is there any associated insomnia phenotype? That also we, we get an idea. Depending upon whether there is a long sleep latency or there are a lot of fragmented uh, fragmentation of sleep present. So a lot of information we get from this. <coughs> this is how this entire information is presented in uh, the sleep study report. Different uh, kind of polysomnographic machines have different uh, 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 the, the template for report presentation is different, but however this information, each and every PSG machine, the data will present us with this kind of information with lights out, lights on, TRT, total sleep time, sleep efficiency, vaso and the like. So what is the respiratory nomenclature now? So the parameters we observe in respiratory events are apnea, hypopnea, shin stroke breathing, hypoventilation, and others. What is an apnea? 
So it is a decrease in air flow by more than 90% of baseline and the event lasts for at least 10 seconds. Hyperpnea is decreased by nearly 30% or more and again for 10 seconds. So these are the indices of apnea, hypoapnea, which means a total number of events per hour of sleep. Apnea index, total number of apneas and hypoapnea index, total number of hypoapneas. Apnea hypopnea index is a combination of age, apnea and hypopnea per hour. Respiratory disturbance index also includes respiratory effort related arousals along with the AHR. So this a little bit more detailed information. This is again the same as we studied in the previous slide. What is AHI? Is the number of apneas and hypopneas per hour of sleep and RDI is AHI plus radar. So these are the parameters which indicate the normal ranges of AHI in children and adult. In children, it should be less than 1, 1 to 2 is mild to say 2 to 5 moderate and 5 to 15 is severe. To remember is that in kids, in children less than 6 years, we also use the uh, carbon dioxide or the entire carbon dioxide or the transcutaneous carbon dioxide sensors to measure the level of carbon dioxide in the blood. So CO2 saturation is also to be monitored in children less than 6 years. In adults, if it is 5 to 15 AHI is mild OSA, 15 to 30 is moderate and more than 30 is severe and likewise for RDI. So what information do we get from this respiratory data? Whether there were respiratory events present, the most important information. Were they in the normal range or they were in the range which suggests sleep related breathing disorders? Were they associated with arousals? Were they associated with positional change like increasing in supine or not increasing in supine? Were they related to specific sleep stages like increasing during REM or not so? Because it is commonly seen that sleep related breathing disorders are worst in supine REM, but this will be confirmed only once the report is in the hands of the clinician. So this is how the uh, respiratory summary is there and this is the entire data which is present numerically and now that we understand we will be able to uh, know that age of 30.3 suggests a severe sleep apnea and RDA of 30.3 also indicates towards the same. So this is the data that will be presented in different forms in different polysomnographic machines. Again, they will also be talking about the apnea index in REM, in non-REM, hypopnea index in non-REM and uh, in the different body positions. The cardiac events that are related to sleep are tachycardia, bradycardia, arrhythmias during sleep and leg movements are, which are related are PLM index and important for diagnosis of REM sleep related disorders. So sinus tachycardia is a sustained sinus heart rate of more than 90 beats per minute for adults during sleep. That is more than six years of age. Bradycardia is heart rate less than 40 per minute for six years to adult. Asystole is a cardiac pause greater than three seconds for ages six years to adults. Likewise, we also look for atrial fibrillations. In the leg EMGs, we look for leg movements and the PLM, that is periodic leg movement series. So what information do we get from the cardiac and the leg movement data? One, is the cardiac dynamics during sleep normal? That is in terms of rhythm or are there arrhythmias present? Is there an association between the rhythm abnormalities and respiratory events? Or is there an association between the respiratory events, arousal and leg movement? That is, arousals occurring especially with uh, apneas, hypoapneas, or arousals associated with leg movements. That is, every PLM is associated with an arousal or arousals are seen at the end of any kind of respiratory event. That kind of information we get. Uh, is there associated sleep fragmentation post the leg movements or even the arousals? So this is how the data will be served to us in the sleep summary. We have data on average heart rate, the highest heart rate, the uh, bradycardias, and the other kinds of arrhythmias if they were present in sleep, along with the leg movements index, that is the PLM index. That all data is presented to us, and this helps us get an idea of what was the Cardiac dynamic, that is the ECG, how, how the cardiac rhythmicity was and what was the leg EMG during the entire course of the sleep study. So we also have the oximeter in the, on the, uh, in the ETCO2, the transcutaneous carbon dioxide channels attacked many a times. Oximeter is recommended for every sleep study. So level of oxygen during study, we monitor then extent and associations of desaturations, how long were the desaturations, then what was the minimum desaturations, 
then uh, is there some kind of CO2 retention present that's indicating hypoventilation and probably that also will give us an idea regarding how to manage the patient. So this is how the data of arousal and oximetric analysis is served. Well, sleep study doesn't get just all these three or four parameters that we discuss. It is a little bit a more detailed analysis. If we wish, we can select channel template, which can give us analysis of delta wave progression. There's a lot of data about the slow wave sleep, spindle frequency and distribution. This kind of data is very useful for research purposes, heart rate variability during sleep, pulse transit time, then hour interval, chill stroke breathing. So according to the clinician's requirement and according to the presentations of the patient, we can select a lot of inputs, a lot of data to be analyzed from the sleep study and that will definitely help in making a better clinical diagnosis and leading towards a more uh, uh, holistic and better management of patients of sleep disorder. So in the conclusion, correct interpretation of information provided in sleep study report will lead to better management and understanding the various markers and surrogate markers used for sleep and associated event is important for sleep medical professionals. Thank you.